Welcome everyone to the Mail Fuzz TV News Podcast. It's been a few weeks, but we are back. Connor's crawled out of his weird cave or whatever he's been doing. I don't know where Connor's been, but he's here and we've got... <sighs> Technically it's three weeks of news, but to be honest, this last week's really not had much, just except from one thing. There's been one thing this past week. It's, it's, it's a one fairly big thing for the but... industry. Everything but, yeah. else is from the previous couple of weeks. Uh, so, I mean, it is, it is worth mentioning that news may be a little dry, actually. If, if the, the strike, which we'll be talking about in a bit, uh, goes on for a while, I mean, I don't know, like, will there be enough news for a show next week after one week? I don't know. Yeah, it's not like they're going to be commissioning new shows when they can't get a writer on it. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we'll, we'll see We'll see how it goes. But, you know, that's just like a warning that it might be, n- not because of our recording schedule, but just because there might not be that much news. Uh, so, but we do have renewals, we have cancellations, we got show orders, we got all these things, because it has been a few weeks, uh, and we'll get into everything. So, starting off with renewals and cancellations, a uh, bunch of things here that we're not that fussed about, but we'll just mention them quickly. Uh, Station 19 has been renewed for Season 7 by ABC. Paige is a big fan of that. Oh, really? Yeah, it 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 goes on Disney Plus over here. The the I I assume part of the the star stuff. Is it a police station or a fire station? I think fire. <laughs> I think I, I I've maybe caught forty five seconds of an episode once. Is it better than all the other procedural shows, or is Paige just got shit taste? Oh yeah, the second one. So, okay. I, I mean, it might be better. I don't know. I haven't seen more than a minute of it to judge. But fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So that's season seven. Uh, ABC also renewed The Good Doctor for season seven. So that's trucking along. And they also renewed Will Trent for season two. So ABC had a few things in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Netflix also renewed Sweet Tooth for a third and final season. So they're wrapping up that story. Which, to be honest, having read the comic, which was about 40 issues, the original run, that actually sounds about... Yeah, that's pretty reasonable. Yeah, like, I, right. I know, obviously, there's a thing with Netflix cancelling shows too soon. But honestly, three seasons for that is fine. I mean, it had a finite amount anyway, story, so uh, it yeah. sounds about right. Even though I, you know, I watched the first two episodes and I, I felt that Netflix pacing in episode two and I just bounced, but... Which is uh, yeah. fair, but that's kind of unrelated to the overall length. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how far they got in terms of, like, the, you know, the original timeline of the story, but at the end of season one, I have no idea. But yeah, I mean, at least it's, it's getting to finish, which, which is which is good for people who are enjoying it. I think Lemay's... Fairly hands on as well. Like he always seems relatively involved with that, so I assume he's kind of going to make sure it has a, a responsible ending, you know, to yeah. where it needs to be. Well, it did. I mean, at the end of that, I mean, there was a sequel eventually, but the end of that forty issue run did have a proper ending. It was over for a long time, so yeah, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, cancellations. National Treasure has been cancelled by Disney Plus after one season, uh, and you're probably thinking. They made a National Treasure show? They That's did? exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> like, word for word, the thought in my head. Which is probably, you know, why it didn't do so well, because uh, they didn't market it very well. Yeah, yeah, they just shut yeah. out at some point, I guess. I I feel like we complain about Amazon and Netflix not advertising stuff. I feel like Disney are kind of guilty of it too, unless it's Marvel or Star Wars. If it's Marvel or Star Wars, it gets all the big ad money spent on it, and you see it everywhere. But if it's not Marvel or Star Wars, it gets just shut out like uh, yeah. these other services. This, this one's crazy to me in the sense that they've got an Indiana Jones film coming up. Like this hits the same sort of mm. vibe. I, I I say without having seen it, but you know, assuming it's doing what it's supposed to do, it's a similar kind of vibe to those movies that I, I feel like. Hey, you know, you your your parents are going to see Indiana Jones because the kids don't care, but. Well, hey, you know, the parents would go home, put this on for the kids, and you know, it's like a gateway into into some of those franchises. Perhaps the, the parents might see it that way. Yeah, I mean, I was I only ever saw the first one, and I was never really fond of it. But you know, people like National Treasure, I guess. But it's it's not obviously got the name value of lots of these other things. This, this is one of these things where, when I'm sure the news came up that they were doing a National Treasure show, I was like, this really this this <laughs> it, it's it's something that conceptually works for me as a tv show obviously i wasn't interested enough to ever watch it but conceptually i i can see how it would function quite nicely as a tv show yeah uh, apple cancelled dear edward after one season again 
I don't know what that is. That was, I have yeah. no idea. Uh, so that's that. Uh, Yellowstone is officially ending with season five, part two. But this is not a surprise because this is them relaunching it. They've already greenlit the sequel. Matthew McConaughey is in talks to, to star. He's not officially signed on yet. He's still just in negotiations. But they're probably moving heaven and earth to make sure it happens. Yeah, and I'm going to assume this is going to take a while to get started now because. I'm, I'm, well, I'm willing to assume Sheridan's part of the, the, the WGA. This article was like from today or yesterday, and it mentioned that this, the sequel show has been greenlit for a December start. I mean, that doesn't mean they're going to start in December, given what's going on right now, but they, they still seem like they think they're going to be starting in December. A- a- ambitious, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, mm-hmm. Premier dates. Uh, we got uh, Warrior Season 3 is coming to Max on June 29th. I didn't realize that was still going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people liked it on Cinemax. It was like one of the few things that kind of lasted as everything changed over. I think we, we watched the first episode, right? We did, yeah. I had that really cool um, the way it treated the, the language barrier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a bad first episode at all. We weren't that oh. interested to keep watching, but it, it was definitely not a bad pilot. I can see why it's got an audience. Like, yeah. It definitely deserved an audience. Uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Season sixteen is starting on June seventh on FX. So, just keeps going. Yep. Uh, now you have uh, Witcher season three part one is launching on June twenty ninth. Part two is launching on July twenty seventh. Yeah, Netflix kind of. Uh, I think understanding finally that it works to split up a bit. Um, obviously, they they they. The high-profile experiment was obviously the Stranger Things one, and and that worked for them. So, see why they'll do it going forward with anything they think they can, you know, get away with. It's big enough to keep people coming back. I mean, obviously, we'd happily they go weekly, but yeah, I mean, if they're just going to split everything into two, that would be something. Uh, so it's better. Like, like I say, you know, they did um, Arcane. They did over three parts. I I quite liked them doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, especially when something's like about nine episodes, it kind of evenly. Yeah, I think, I think it was three weeks of three episodes yeah. for Arcane. So then we also have The Horror of Dolores Roach coming on July 7th on Amazon. I've got a description for this one because obviously it's a new thing. Uh, yep. The eight episode series based on the hit a Gimli podcast of the same name tells the story of Dolores Roach, a recently released prisoner who, after 16 years, Returns to find a severely gentrified Washington Heights with $200 and clothes on her back. Her boyfriend missing, her family long gone, Dolores reunites with an old stoner buddy, Lewis, uh, who gives her room and board and lets her give uh, massages for cash in the basement under his uh, dilapidated storefront. Um, yeah, I don't know. But... I'm vaguely familiar with this in that I've seen it recommended to me on like lists of narrative podcasts in the past. Hmm. So it, it it's definitely got some kind of, you know, right into it originally. Yeah, what's interesting about this is that it, at no point in that description does it get to the horror part of it. Like, no. I don't know what the horror... Like, I assume, you know, she gets a dodgy customer at some point and it leads her down a rabbit hole or something, but... It, it, it never the never, horror is gentrification. Yeah, it never kind of gets to it, but there you go. Primer dates. Uh, there was a couple of trailers this week, uh, which I have to confess I forgot to watch, but I made Connor watch them so he can tell me about them. <laughs> I did watch them. <laughs> so, uh, honestly, I mean, the bigger news here is probably that just both are things that are existing. That are real. Uh, so first up was Twisted Metal, which is based on the PlayStation game, which is coming to Peacock uh, with Anthony Mackie. Oh. Uh, how'd this look? Generic. Um, it, it, it's, it starts with like him in a, in a car, putting a, putting, a, putting a CD player on and everything. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it's it's giving me like a little bit of a vibe, but then it got just the rest of the trailer. You know, it has that as like a an intro bit, and then it comes up with oh, this is what it is, and then it's just some just generic trailer stuff. It, it didn't look particularly interesting. I'm sorry. Not as wacky as it maybe should be no. based on the game. Okay. No. Because uh, it's, it's a car combat game. For anyone doesn't know what Twisted Metal is, it's uh, cars try to like kill each other basically. Yeah. Uh. So. Uh, and then the other trailer was Black Mirror Season 6, which uh, 
it's just interesting that there's a season six and it's kind of it's ready to go soon so yeah far more interesting ah uh, one slight concern i have potentially about an upcoming episode is uh you got cause I, have you seen any of the cast list i think i saw that aaron paul was in it but I've not yes anything else and it seems like it may be a sequel to uss callister oh okay which that's, that's not actually a bad thing it's it's not inherently a bad thing. It's just a little bit concerning because I'm like, hmm, is that just them trying to kind of play on some past greatest hits or have they actually got a good episode? I mean, I'm hoping it's the latter. The idea of an anthology show having an episode that's a sequel to another episode, I think it's an interesting idea. And I'd prefer that to something being a rehash of an earlier, because they've done this before where I think there's a few episodes in season four. Well, I liked USS Callister as a standout of that season. Mm -hmm. But there's a few episodes in that season that just kind of feels like this is this season's attempt at San Junipero. This is this season's attempt at Shut Up and Dance, and they're weaker as a result. Yes. At least if it's a sequel and the thematic, you know, tone of it is supposed to carry over, it at least doesn't feel like... I, I, I will say, it, I could be wrong, but it, it's Aaron Paul, he seems to be on a spaceship. Mm. I, I'm, I'm making that connection based off of, you know, the ending of that episode before. It could so, just be a, yeah, an episode with Aaron Paul on a spaceship. It, it could be completely unrelated. Keep, keep it in mind that USS Callister, they weren't really on a spaceship. This could literally just be him on a spaceship. <laughs> it, it could well be. And it's a very different look. It's it's much more dingy sort of spaceship mm. stuff. But I'm assuming sequel just based off of that. I, I could be wildly wrong. Um, I will say that there's, the trailer looks... It, it's a well-put-together trailer. It doesn't give you much of what any of the episodes really are. There's one shot of a diner uh, with the, the, the and the mood of the trailer. It's very Twin Peaksy the way mm. it kind of comes across. Um, the the standout, most terrifying moment of the trailer is a woman hooking up to the internet in presumably the early two thousands, and you hear the dial up tone, and oh, oh <laughs> pure horror. <laughs> there is nothing scarier. Very good. Very yeah, good. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm obviously excited and interested in more Black Mirror because how can how can you not be? Um, uh, I don't there, think... Is there any indication of how many episodes are in? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I just went to Wikipedia to see if it could just tell me, uh, but it doesn't list anything for it yet. No, I don't think it did say. Um, it looked like at least at least six, maybe, by what I could see in there. Really? Because but... la last season was only three, which is why I'm I'm uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's more than three. I mean, uh, unless some of the stuff is more related than it seems in this trailer. Like, okay. it, it's, there's a lot of stuff that seems very unrelated, but maybe they are just different parts of episodes. Okay. I would have guessed six, but I could be completely wrong. Yeah. I mean, it has been a whale since season five, so maybe that's part of the reason, is they just wanted to actually do a, a six-episode season again. Because uh, be, season yeah. five was June 2019, so it's been four years since the last season, to put it yeah. in perspective, which came two years after season four, which was, believe it or not, only one year after season three. So... Oh, they, they pumped that season out. They did. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's interesting it's coming back. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see what it is, because season five wasn't loved, and it's definitely not in the high point of the show, but, like... I would say I relatively enjoyed it, even though I don't think any of the episodes came close to like what's special about Black Mirror. Yeah, none of them are all timers, but I don't. And there's, there's probably like one bad episode, but that's kind of normal in shows of this style. Yeah, but I don't remember it being a bad season. I remember, you know, enjoying it well enough. I haven't rewatched it, but yeah, I mean, I think it's debatable. I mean, I think season four maybe just gets a win because USS Callister, but. Like, if you take the rest of the five episodes of season four and put them against season uh, five, I don't really know if there's an easy winner between them. Like, they're, they're, they're kind of... Yeah. Neither one... After, after USS Callus, I don't think season four stands out that much. Whereas season three, I think you have two solid episodes and then you have the two best episodes the show's ever had. And then it does kind of... I'd say there's one weak episode and one still good episode. Yeah, yeah. There's like a, the the last two of season three are a bit weaker than the rest of them for sure. But it's those two in the middle are, like you say, they're they're up amongst the best of the show. 
yeah so it's uh I don't know, well, season three is still the peak for me, but we'll we'll see what uh, they do with season six. Uh, so I have some general stuff. Obviously, the, the big thing to to mention here is the writer strike, and they're officially on strike. Obviously, that was that's in the past week. That's that's we've transitioned into actual strike time. Um, as of May second, I believe. And notably as well, um, a lot of like writers guilds or associations from other the rest of the world who have writers who live in the US writing for US content, um, a lot of them have said, yeah, don't write. Like, stop. <laughs> like, so uh, yeah. I know the UK said that, Australia said that, Canada said that, and I believe I also saw India said that, and there may be more, but those were the ones that I, I saw in passing. I think it's worth noting it's specifically the writers from those countries writing for US shows yeah. that they shouldn't write for. They can still, like, UK writers can still write for UK shows completely fine. Like UK productions, they can still write for those. They just yeah. they're advised not to write for US productions. Yeah, because there's obviously there's a lot of writers from all over the world who write for US shows. So yes. this is a lot of them saying, no, don't do it. You you can sort of take part in the strike. I mean, I guess if they don't live in the US, uh, maybe they have like obviously an easier time writing for something else in the meantime. But mm -hmm. uh, it is interesting. There's kind of a solidarity kind of just amongst writers all over the planet, and I, I think part of that is because. The US very much is the top of the industry and kind of everything trickles down from there. And I think there's a, a an effort to, we don't want the US writing system to establish a precedent that no one else wants. So uh, yeah. everyone's kind of on board. So I know it was interesting. There's a lot of talk about whether it would affect Doctor Who um, because, mm. so obviously that has a lot of writers that are international, are, are part of the, the WGA. Um because obviously they, they they write a lot of stuff in America as well, but it usually wouldn't have been that big of a deal because it would it's a UK production. But yeah, but as now of it's Disney half season, Disney Plus. there is Disney. Yeah. There's Disney Plus money involved, so there was some questioning. It seems to be it's still uh, under uh, UK uh, production completely, oh, okay. um, even though they're taking Disney Plus money. It's not under their guilds. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, so. I mean, there's a, like, honestly, so this is one of these things where there's a lot going on and how much of it are we really going to talk about in any great depth? I think, you know, the, the key things that are being discussed in this strike, they're the same stuff as last time, of course. It's residuals from streaming. It's residuals from these new media outlets. But there's also a few new key details. There's two that stick out in particular. Yeah. Um, one is the emergence of AI and AI being used to basically just do some writing instead of a person that obviously everyone's a little concerned about and wants to stop the studios from Typically, going down that path. the concern is, is not a full AI script. No one thinks that's there. Uh, yeah, but more, work, yeah. more studios using AIs as, as prompts to get first drafts and then giving that to a writer to turn into a full script instead oh. of instead of starting with a, a yeah. spec script already. Which, no writer, no creative writer who likes writing is going to enjoy doing that. That that no, takes away this, all of the passion of whatever I, they do. I know for a fact this has already been implemented in some video game studios. And, okay, with the caveat that this started maybe six months ago where AI wasn't maybe as advanced. You know, you know, advancements are happening very fast in that field. There is no arguing that. So maybe it's slightly better now than it was six months ago when this was first coming up. Um... But they were mandated to, for things like you know, law entries and you know stuff like that. Get the AI prompt, get that again, you know, to do the bulk of it, and then the writers just yeah, okay, touch it up, tweak it, go over it. And for most of the writers, apparently, they found it to be significantly more work to have to go through, mm -hmm. read, you know, understand what it's saying, then redo it in a in in the style that needs to be, make all the corrections, and it's it's it took them longer and was more effort than just writing the thing from scratch. Yeah, I mean, honestly, in in a world where I am already complaining that certain big budget movies, you know, I'm looking at the MCU, I'm looking at some of the more general stuff uh, like that. It wasn't so long ago we were talking about Netflix movies, yeah. you know, how where you feel. I'm already arguing that some stuff feels like it's generated by AI, and it isn't, but it's been kind of, you know, made to feel the most lowest common denominator kind of thing. Actually using AI to get closer to that ideal, um... It's just as someone who actually watches, you know, content, <laughs> I'm not yeah. on board with that. So, and I think from a creative perspective, if you're a creative person, and you are, if you've become a writer, if you care about writing, uh, 
all of a sudden being handed something that a computer's generated and told touch that up yeah is, there's yeah. also an inherent stagnation that it will hit because ais they, they don't or, or current ais what we have they're just predictive text models yeah they don't come up with anything from scratch they can't create they can just analyze what's already in the system and then regurgitate it in a well, in, in new ways yeah but what's the, what's the problem with these things that feel generic is that that's what the studios are doing they're, they want things to feel like stuff i've already had so in a weird way it feeds into their worst habits <laughs> it, it does it does but eventually there's a point where okay well if we're not producing new things to f you know from fresh writers to feed into the algorithms it's just going to be rehashing the same things yeah. repeatedly and, which like and on top of, on top of you know obviously the creative side of it of like there's no creativity it's not art because it's not coming from someone who's expressing something because ai isn't expressing anything you know there's been this kind of thing where the signs that people are using you know when they're picking uh mm. it's like they've got the, the writer's strike thing at the top but they've, they've all got blank spaces for the writers themselves to write something funny on them yeah. and there's been some good photos and you know one of them just random photo i saw was uh you know, AI doesn't have childhood trauma. <laughs> and it was like, they can't write properly because they've not been through shit. And then there's yeah. other ones, like, I asked GT, chat GDP to, to write this sign. <laughs> it was shit. <laughs> yeah. You know, just stuff like that. And it, so you've got that side of it, which is this new emerging, like, thing. And obviously, the visual art, you know, in terms of, like, paintings, drawings, is also facing the whole thing, which we won't get into, but that's obviously facing uh, this in another way as well. The other big talking point here that I'm seeing a lot of uh, coming out of this is that more and more studios seem to not want to have rating staff that they hire for, and this is maybe specifically more for TV shows than it is for movies, but um, where you know you hire a team of writers who have a job for the year to write and work on the show that is being produced yearly for however many years. So it's like a steady job for however long it may be, right? And obviously there's always a risk of a show being cancelled and that that's always been the case. But more and more, they're cutting down on how many writers they keep on staff, and they're just wanting to like hire a writer for a, like one freelance quick job. And I've I've heard some writers say they they feel like they're being treated like Uber drivers with the way they're getting hired to just come in and do one thing and then being told to to go away. And mm. one of the concerns is is that it's making it very difficult for writers to actually have a career writing. It's like the all the stability, all of the actual being able to make a living and rely on it as their income is dwindling for anyone below a certain line you know obviously the showrunners are still getting their steady jobs because they have to be a showrunner but they're that line of like where you've the made it writers, yeah, yeah to to actually live off this and that's your career now you don't have to have another day job that line is going further and further up the chain and that's something that they're they're really concerned about right I think now this this is surprisingly i think the one that might be the most contentious to the studios oh, probably yeah because i think like okay you know the uh the residuals it's like three percent that they're asking for i think ultimately i think they can win that the ai thing i think again that's very winnable this i think has it's a lot more difficult to fight especially when there's arguments along the lines of well what about yellowstone sheridan writes every episode himself they don't have a team of staff writers, but you know, the, you know, the part of the clause, I, from what I understand, having not, I've not looked in depth, but from what I understand is, okay, you have to have, a, you know, a minimum uh, amount of writers per show, um, and you know, you're on staff at all times, and it's like, well, what about those shows where it is just one writer, and that, yeah, that's I mean, all it is. Again, I'm outside the industry here, but I don't think there's anything wrong. If if, if, if a show is, is brought to, like a Yellowstone, and he says, I'm going to write the whole thing, I don't really have a problem with that. I don't think that's unfair to other writers in the industry that someone's in a position where they can just write a whole show. That's a lot of work to undertake for himself. It is, it absolutely is, but Presumably, though, that's keeping him from taking any jobs elsewhere from anyone because he's too busy working on his one show. I would think so. The, 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 the fact that he's churned out any movies at all while doing this, and good movies at that, is shocking. So, I, yeah, I don't really have a problem with that particular type of example, but I, I do, like, I completely get what they're saying about I, the rest no, of I, it. No, I'm, 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 as a general thing, I'm completely on the, the writer's side here, obviously. But I think that's the sticking point that they're going to struggle with on this fight more than anything. And I think because there are arguments like that that the studios can throw in their faces, and and, and the studios they'll they'll frame it as, oh, but what about the creative freedom? What about you know you know the the auteurs who who 
who are coming in here and doing this and it's not fair on them that you know that their vision should be sullied that'll be their arguments and that'll be the one that is going to really you know be the, the the fighting point i think yeah, I mean, I think the solution might be is you just have different classifications where when a show starts and it's like, no, this is an auteur-driven thing where one person is basically the only person writing that, uh, and that's okay. But then for any show that's going to have a, a writer's room, there has to be, you know, you have to actually staff it with people who are employed for the duration of the show, and it's not just, you know, a, a la carte <laughs> come in for one episode and piss off kind of yeah. kind of thing. And you know, this it's, it's very easy to kind of like think about this and relate to it in a general sense. Because I think any creative work is there's this idea that so many people consume so much creative content, whether it's streaming services, movies, or yeah, like even where we are on YouTube. And there's this idea that to actually, for the people to be able to keep doing that and for it to be consistent and always be there as a reliable thing, they have to make a living off of it. And to do that, you know, it has to be... It has to be sustainable, and I think the penny pinching of the studios to try and like make it easier to to not have to like pay people consistently is just making it so these people who are writing the shows who should be making a living off of it can't and have to do other things or they're scraping their their, their clawing and it's, it kind of goes to that like uh you know, the struggling actor thing where you're getting all these little jobs here or there but you're barely passing you're still having to work two other jobs just to pay rent or whatever yeah. and. It's like, it shouldn't necessarily be like that. It should be just, you know, it, it, it should just be, they can make a living writing the content so they can actually focus on it. They're, they'll be better at it because they're not like having to like, you know, struggle their time with like other things and can actually keep delivering the things. So, for, I mean, for, for the audience perspective, like you should want the writers to win. Like the, the writers winning and keeping the studios from having too much like control and power is good for everyone it just is the only people it does not benefit is the greedy executives at the studios who we should always want to lose because if they can get away with murder they will get away with murder um, what do you mean if <laughs> okay allegedly allegedly <laughs> <laughs> they may have gotten away with murder repeatedly in the past uh, but we can now confirm or deny these allegations well we're naming no specific names we're just assuming that at least one of them definitely has <laughs> Honestly, that's a probably pretty fair statement, that at least one studio executive in the past hundred years of Hollywood has gotten away with a murder. That is probably factually I, correct. I'm, I'm willing to say that, yeah, that, that has to have happened. Especially if you go back to, like, the old, you know, when the studios ran everything in Hollywood. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't surprise me. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, and obviously... Like it's, it's different from YouTube and stuff. You have know, topic creatives, and you know, we have things like Patreon. We have stuff like you know because because the ad revenue is basically nothing. So it's, it's all about like you know fan funding and stuff like that. Because YouTube's a bitch for that. <laughs> so, but you know, you, you, but that's like the the great extent of it. Where the whole point of there being an industry is that it should have a reliable income. It should it should you know you have an entire industry of executives and a hierarchy. It's not just one some you know one man show who, who's trying to make a living writing it's supposed to be a system that works and it's not it's it's failing the writers who i don't know if anyone's noticed this but if you don't have writers then movies tv video game everything now admittedly this doesn't affect video games this is specifically movies and tv the writers guild but you know and oh, oh we should point out as well this does not affect animated shows. They fall under a different guild because they're not allowed to be part of the WGA. So those shows are continuing to write. And their their terms are already significantly shittier. Yeah. Which is actually kind of a shame in a weird way. So it's almost like by segregating it, they've made it harder for them to mobilize a, a, an offensive yes. uh, strike or anything like that. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a shame uh, that they're yeah. kind of... And the, it's and the guard, a, they've but. always been a separate guild, and it is kind of shitty. Yeah, yeah, it's it's almost it's almost like gerrymandering, like your writing staff. That, that's exactly so, what it is. Yeah. So so they can't like all unite. Yeah, it's just yeah. This is the thing. Like you know, obviously you want the writers to win, but that doesn't necessarily mean yeah. But what about all the other people who get hired for one day jobs, like on movie sets and TV sets, like. Like a makeup artist is like, yeah, come in, do two days of work, and yeah, we'll see you maybe in five years. <laughs> like, you know, like there's a lot of other jobs in the industry that could use this type of like, and, and a lot of them are also going to be struggling right now. Obviously, with the writer strike, it's putting a lot of shows out of production entirely. You have oh, yeah. some which are 
insisting they're going to carry on shooting without any writers on set, which, uh, to name at least two high-profile examples... Yeah, I had these written um, down, actually, yeah. The, the Lord of the Rings show, Rings of Power, the second season of that, and uh, I believe the second season of House of Dragon. Yeah, I'll, um, to be fair to the Lord of the Rings show, and I'm not one to play devil's advocate for Earth and Lord of the Rings, uh, but apparently they're only 19 days away from finishing, so I presume that the writing... It's probably mostly done. Yeah. It'll be more that there can be no on-set edits. Yeah, on no amendments or anything like that, which it could lead to uh, some rough things. Like you say, you know, but... they're, they're probably close to being done 19 days out of probably a fairly lengthy shoot, given the, the scope of the show. I mean, if it's 10 episodes, yeah, they were probably shooting for at least four or five months. Yeah, um, it, it, you might not feel it as much with that one, but I don't know House of the Dragon. Yeah, I, um, yeah. I mean, um, I will say this from from an audience perspective. I don't think we're going to feel this one as much as the last one. Uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember the two thousand eight writer strike, and I think part of it is um, because all of us, I think, were watching more stuff on network TV at the time, and all of that came to a grinding halt for a few months. You know, I, I was watching Lost at the time, I was watching The Office at the time, you know, there was a bunch of shows that just yep. stopped. And then they came back a few months later. Uh, that said, though, by the sounds of it, when this started, it's it did not sound like, oh, they were close and just couldn't quite come to terms. It sounded like, fundamentally, they were miles apart as far as meeting in the middle. Which means this might go on for a while. And if this goes on for a long time, it could be, it could be possible. You wouldn't really feel it this year for movies, but mid to late next year into the following year could actually start... To, that could be where you feel it later on. Yeah, uh, especially for uh, streaming services as well. Mo movies that, you know, we've had some executives saying, oh, well, it's going to have to go on a while before we feel it, and that's, that's true. Well, there's uh, one notable... Uh, the exception to that, I don't know if you, this just literally just broke, uh, movie-wise, uh, the Blade movie has just went on pause, because they just hired a writer <laughs> this week, and now it's on pause because the writer's straight. So, I, I did not see that one, no, uh, okay. And that movie's already been paused before for other reasons, so that movie feels cursed, but to be fair, a lot of things will be pausing <laughs> because of this writer's strike, it's not just that, but... Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, there's already like a relatively high profile. Oh, this movie's just on pause now. They can't. It's, it's got a release date next year, which is probably not hitting now. Unless yeah. this writer strike will last a couple of weeks, which I don't think it is. I I can see this being months, at least. I I could see it being over six months. I can as well. I would not be surprised at all if if we're still talking about this at the start of next year. Yeah, I'm not saying I think that's likely, but I agree I would not be surprised. I'm not, okay, I, I say, I'm not saying I think it's likely, but I also don't think it's particularly unlikely either. <laughs> like, I, th I think it's even. If, if you tell me it's still going on in eight months, I'd go, yeah, yeah sure. Like, I, I, can, I can see that. With, like I say, with how fundamentally different they seem to be at the, at the negotiating table, um, there's, a, there's a lot of ground to cover, and... And also, like you say, we're not going to feel the impact as soon. The studios aren't going to feel the impact as soon because they're working on slightly different models to what they were, <laughs> you know, 15 years ago. What's so funny about that, though, is, like, that's why it may last a while, because the studios may think, oh, we can hold out. But once we get to the point where the impact starts to hit them financially because they're not releasing it's things... It's going to hit them really hard <laughs> Yeah, and really that's fast, when they're going to be like, gonna... shit. The, the, the question is, will they realise in time to recognize when they run out of content to put out, especially, so network, almost take network out of the equation right now. We're looking at the streaming and the- yeah, uh, network's a different beast. Network is- Yeah. Uh, because they're so close to when they air when they're making those shows that those are instantly just about to stop and they'll be off until, and they'll come back the quickest as well though. Like when the strike's done, yes. the network TV shows will be back quicker than anything else because of the but turnaround. we're talking your, 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 your HBO shows, your streaming services, things like, you know, you, you, "Quote unquote premium television." Yeah, I guess what you're saying here is that effectively, the worst case scenario is that they don't actually decide to give in and meet in the middle somewhere from the studio side until there's not stuff to release. But if they get to that point, then it's a long wait until they've got any more yeah, stuff it, to release. It'll take another year at least before they'll have anything new to release again because they'll have to go and write things and make if, things. And, and, and if they don't have the foresight to recognize they're going to hit that point and come to a compromise bef you know, early enough, oh, it's going to hit them really hard. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure they're looking ahead. I'm sure they're thinking about that. But in that worst case scenario where that happens, 
it will almost be like the pandemic again. There will literally yes. be a year and a half to two years of a drought because of that. If if if, mm-hmm. if indeed that happens now again, I don't think that's the likely. I, I think they're not. That's idiots. a worst case scenario. They they must not, and they can't surely can't afford that right after the the pandemic. No, because they've just been through them. that. Yeah. Uh, the movie theaters will all be like, get their pitchforks out for the studios. Like, well, you bastards, we just barely survived just, that just pandemic. Just give the writers whatever the hell they want. <laughs> we need movies to play, damn it. <laughs> I, I think if it gets far enough along like that, the writers can push for even more, let's be honest. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll... They're like, oh, did we say 3%? Sorry, we meant 6%. And for the, for the record, if we have to have a bit of a drought for, like, the writers and people who are further down the food chain to get a fair pay from, from the studios... Like, it's a sacrifice we should all be willing to make. It's fine. We can yeah, do it. Yeah, I mean, uh, to anyone who can afford it, I'm sure there are already funds being started up to help cover the livelihoods of people involved. Um, um, it was last time. I know, you know, people donate mm-hmm. to various funds to, you know, because obviously these people have no jobs. They have no income for potentially months. Um, I know, I, with, with various, I, I, the things that were hit the very first, before even network shows, late night chat shows, Oh yeah, they're, they're instant. Yeah, they're, they're instant because they because they're so current events driven. They're gone within the de- within the day or two. Um, I know. Last time, I think it, I want to say it was John Stewart. Basically, almost bankrupt himself, personally paying for all of his staff. You know, for months uh, after you know they, well, because they were like, well, it's not fair on them. Well, he'll he'll it, be glad has uh has has he's got a show just now but it's not it's not the network show he had before that had as many I could, people. yeah i could be wrong i i, I feel like it was sean Stewart, but i, I don't want to be 100 percent. he sure, seems I mean, like a nice enough guy so it probably he, was, he is. <laughs> i know uh james corden was an absolute shitbag with what he did recently oh oh he um he went to a a guild uh, a writer's guild meeting kind of in the run-up to whether they should strike or not I took along his producers for his for his show that i think just ended anyway but you know but, you know, this was kind of in the run-up before it ended yeah it got cancelled yeah yeah took no writers with him just his producers and him and tried to talk them into why certain things would be a good idea for them um while claiming he was on the writer's side but yeah yeah clearly not i mean he's a prick so i'm not, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not exactly. surprised uh, how long till how long how long till conan starts spinning his wedding ring again hmm yeah. You know, uh, I just, yeah, I mean, obviously, like, yeah, I mean, we're on the right side. However long this takes is however long it takes. Um, and hey, it'll be a good chance to get some of our backlogs done if there's is, no new content it's, for a bit. It's a very different world to last time. I think there is a backlog there for us to watch significantly easier than there was 15 years ago. Uh, for most people, it's significantly more accessible. That is true. Um, um so make the most of the time when when your TV runs out in the probably nearer the future than than you probably think. Yeah. Well, I, I think cable and streaming you don't feel it for a while. Like I, I'll take six months on them before yeah, you feel it. Yeah. I, I don't think you'll feel it. Yeah, till towards the end of the year with them. But ne- next year, what will be funny is if network if the, if the straight does end later this year, and hopefully it does. Uh, it means that network TV will be back. Just the streaming and cable are having their drought. They'll they'll. They won't sync up. Uh, Which I mean, you never know. Could well be, you know, the the, the time for some network writers to really show what they've still got, and you oh, know, yeah, and, yeah. and to maybe win some people back. If they, hey, if if no one else has got any content, and you've got to watch network stuff again if you want something new. Which let's be honest, as much as we've all got backlogs, there's a reason why we all watch new stuff. It's because hey, that's the new thing. Yeah, <laughs> that'll yeah. be their chance. <laughs> So we'll move on, we'll move on. Uh, there's one other little tidbit uh, before we get into the new shows, um, and that is just that we've got a, an actor cast in the Alien show, which uh, and Noah Hawley's making, FX. Uh, Cindy Chandler from Don't Worry Darling has been set to star in it, so uh, that's, presumably she's the lead of this show. I think so, yeah, from the headline I saw. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, even even before the strike, this was a mate be out next year because obviously they're waiting until the Fargo's done shooting before this gets going. I don't know if it's already written, so therefore it can just go into production. And still. I, I don't know how Holly works. If he is a uh, the kind of guy who sticks religiously yeah. to his scripts, or does he change things on set? I also 
Because I know how he's directed some stuff, and I'm not sure exactly what the rules are for people in the Writers Guild who also direct stuff. Are they still they, directing? They can, direct, they can still direct. Oh, okay. They're just not allowed to change any of the words. They can't be like, <laughs> oh, can we give me a different line reading but change some of the words to this or that? Because then that comes under them doing writing duties. What if an actor ad-libs, though? Uh, ad libs, I think, are fine because if they're not part of the guild, because that's still yeah. They're just, they're like, the obviously, if they're part, of, if they, if they're part of a writers guild as well. Cause I know, um, famously, one of the problems with the office was Steve Carell was also part of the writers guild. Oh, so if he um, ad libbed death, and technically that counts as him writing something. <laughs> yes. And I know, um, <laughs> and he was like, so, he he had a whole thing of solidarity. He would just phone in sick for like the first like three weeks of them trying to shoot anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got a bit of a cough. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that man. <laughs> anyway, uh, so getting to the comedies, uh, I think there's maybe an animated thing or two here. I don't know. I like a lot of this news because we were going to record last week and we had to push. Uh, so a lot of this news from this point on, I I did last week, so I don't remember any of it. Uh, yeah, you can rediscover it now, and maybe there'll be some gems. Yeah. So first up, uh, Boat Rocker and Shamir Anderson and Stephen James Baymill Studios are developing Christopher Robin, an R-rated comedic reimagining uh, of A. A. Milne's beloved characters. Um, so I hate already. This this is the same as our stupid, awful-looking Winnie the Pooh horror film that. By all accounts, is terrible. Blood and honey. Yeah, that's not maybe very good, but this is the thing. All this shit's went public domain, so it's an uh, open season for anyone, baby. Uh, <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I, uh, I can't but wait. We have to do it R rated. Like, I, I, I'm not opposed to people using things that are public domain, but this is people doing it R rated just because they can now. Yeah. Because there's I, no one to like, tell them not to. Again, it's just, I mean, it's possible that one of these could end up being good, but yeah, the, the first example was. Oh, maybe they're all terrible. just going to. Okay. I say. This, as a generalization, with yes, there is the possibility I will be proved wrong with one of them being good, but they're all just being edgy and pushing boundaries because they can. I don't think any of them will that actually said, be any good. That said, I will enjoy when when Mickey Mouse goes public domain in the very near future. <laughs> I yeah, will enjoy- yeah if, if Disney ever allows that to happen. Oh, no, I read a great article recently, actually, about how... Like they're, they're not like we're getting close to that dead. Like, cause there, so there was a years away, yeah. there was an extension in the nineties because it was about to go public domain and Disney's lawyers and all the rest of it. They all got the copyright like time period extended, and uh, but we're getting close to it. It's, it's like it's literally just a couple of years uh, until I think it's like twenty five. I want to say yeah. Um, and there's like no like if they were they... Going, if they were going to try and extend it like. The, the talks would already be happening. Like they'd already be doing stuff. No, they're, they're too busy fighting DeSantis off, <laughs> off of whatever, the, whatever the hell he's playing at. Uh, but the reason being is, I mean, keep in mind, when things go public domain, only the version that's that old, so, like, only Steamboat Willie Mickey Mouse goes public domain. It's not like every, you know, version of Mickey Mouse is suddenly, like... So everyone will be like, can, can we do our own Fantasia? <laughs> it's like, no, 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 you can't. Well, not yet. <laughs> well, you got a while, but yeah. yeah. Um, you know, only the things that are from that specific original version of public domain. But um, basically, there was a whole thing now where, like, the, basically, people, the end, all the people in the industries and all that are all pro things going public domain after a certain time period. Basically, they kind of got away with extending it in the nineties because people in general were just less informed, and there was a lot less, like there was less of a movement whereas now you've got so much creation on the internet with people like mixing and matching and doing things that the world's just changed so much since the 90s that basically i read an article that was like people just believe they won't even try because then there's no point they're not going to win uh so this 90 year like time period or whatever the exact number is is Might probably what's gonna stick it. yeah no, but to be fair that, that's that's plenty that's a of long time, time. yeah um, I think uh, um, music's even longer if you if yeah. you believe that it's because that's I think it's like seventy or ninety years after the person dies, so it's their entire life plus another. I like, mean, ninety years. At that point, you've already set your next four generations up for riches. Yeah. Well, that's that's plenty. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. It's plenty. I mean, it wasn't until like it's within the last decade that um, that people stopped paying royalties for using. Uh, Happy birthday. I know, I remember I th- that. I don't, yeah, because they, they never I used to Tony use it. that had the rights to that, yeah. Yeah, they never used to use it. They used to always have to come up with all this other birthday song. There's a reason why when you went to TGI Fridays, uh, they would have their own birthday song, because legally, they, they couldn't even sing it in there. Yeah, because <laughs> Sony got a cut every time someone did. But that's changed, obviously. It's bought a domain now, so sing it to your heart's yeah. content. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, you know what? Copyright law is a thing unto itself. Just, and 
just imagine though, Carter. We're 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 literally <laughs> less than a decade away from Superman being public domain. I know, but again, it's a very specific yes, version of yes. Superman. It can't fly. Has no kryptonite things. Has yes. all, all, all of the a things. Fraction of his powers. Yeah, all of the things you should do with Superman. But technically speaking, Superman will be public domain in less than a decade, and that's kind of wild. Oh, it's. <laughs> Anyway, we, we, I, we're about to enter the wild west of internet creations. We're, ta- we're talking about uh, uh, this one of the poo, Christopher Robin thing. Ah, uh, yeah, I suppose we should. So, the project's based on an original script from Charlie uh, Kess- Kesslering, who also executive produced. Uh, Conrad Vernon from Shrek 2 and Sausage Party is on board to direct the pilot episode, so maybe that gives you a sense of tone. But well, I mean, those are two very different movies. Uh, Christopher Robin is a comedic live-action animation hybrid reimagining of A.A. Milne's Way of the Pooh. Uh, per the logline, Christopher Robin is a disillusioned New Yorker navigating his quarter-life crisis with the help of weird-talking animals who live beyond a drug-induced portal outside his derelict apartment complex. I hate this. So he basically, they're saying that he takes like, acid or something, and that's how he meets all of the Way of the Pooh characters that he talks to. Yeah. That's, that's what they're doing. Like the first part of that is not... Like, up until it gets to, you know, the drugs, it's not that dissimilar to the... Um, the movie, the movie with, from uh, a few years ago, Ewan McGregor, right? Yeah. Yeah, like that concept, uh, the first part of that description was kind of along those lines, and then it curveballed into, well, we've got to make this edgy somehow. Uh... Yeah, I don't, I don't really care about whether the poo anyway, so I don't really have any attachment to any of it. I don't have, like, a deep attachment, but more just in principle of these things being annoying. Mm. Uh, so we have some animated things uh, from DC, believe it or not, uh, to talk about. So Good. we already had the two-season order at Amazon for Batman The Cape Crusader. Uh, but we also now have another thing that Amazon have ordered. So they've got an animated movie coming called Merry Little Batman, and that's going to spin off into another animated series, uh, which is called, uh, was it Bat Family, I think? Bat Family, I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so, basically, this is a more kid-focused like focused thing. It's focused on Damien, and it's like a, almost like a Home Alone in the, the Wayne Manor kind of thing. The movie specifically. The movie is, is yeah. And yeah. then the, the show will just be like following this Batman, Alfred, and Damien on their adventures. Uh, it's got a very specific animated style. It's like a screenshot in the articles if you go look look for it. But uh, definitely very different, especially when uh, the Cape Crusader show is that de- because it's Bruce Tim, it's J.J. Abrams producing, Matt Reeves producing it. It's clearly aimed at people who grew up with the animated series and who are adults now. Uh, yeah. Not that I'm expected to be like a hard R rated thing or anything like that. No, but, but tonally, the writers involved, the things they've said about in the past, it feels like they they they've spoken very specifically about having like a, a noir feeling to mm. it. So that's skewing older. This is like another animated show that's skewing younger. So, uh, I I'm all for this again. I don't think this will be for us. I don't think we'll ever care about this show, even quality aside. But I'm glad that it exists on Amazon at the same time as the other one because I think the I, kids I just, should have a Batman show as well. Like they should. We can, we can have both. Yeah. Everyone can be happy. I mean, I'm just glad that some interesting animated series for DC characters are happening and that somewhere other than HBO Max is <laughs> allowing them to exist. It's just nice. Yeah. So, very good. Uh, next up, there's an animated adaptation in the works for Vampire Survivors. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing I think I read in the last I week. Did, I did see the headline and yeah. I was like... I don't even know how this is going to work. I'm going to wait and let you tell me how yeah. it's going to work. So Story Kitchen is partnering with the game's developer, uh, Ponkel founder, uh, Luca Galante, if I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, to adapt the comedic gothic horror video game into a premium animated television series. In the game, described as Vox Machina meets Castlevania, players control an automatically attacking character while fighting against continuous waves of monsters, with the goal being to survive the onslaught as long as possible. And this next paragraph th- what throws me because I so I want to make this I, clear. I, I, I've never played. I know you've played quite a bit. I've not. Yeah. I did not realize there was any semblance of story. Hold on, hold on. I want to make something clear here. I have played something in the realm of fifty plus hours of Vampire Survivors. It's a very addictive, fun little game. So I'm making it clear that I have played fifty plus hours before I read this next paragraph. The game is set in 2021 rural Italy. What? Is it? <laughs> is it? 
What are you talking about? <laughs> I've done, what are you talking about? That, that was, I, hey, don't get me wrong. I believe Stephanie Sterling does write a lot of the character descriptions that you can go and find in the menu. So I assume somewhere in there, there's a bunch of lore that I have never looked at where this comes from. But it's not like you can play the game and never like hear a word of this. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there lived an evil person named Bisconti Draculo. News to me, whose many evil magics created a bad world filled with famine and suffering. It's now up to the members of the Belipaese family to end his reign of terror and return the good food to the table. I have never heard of any of these names or words. That, like, I have played so much of this game and I I, I don't know any of this. <laughs> all, all I got from that is the, the family name there was clearly a riff on the uh, the Belmonts from oh, Castlevania. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which makes sense. Which makes sense. I mean, obviously, it's, it's obviously a clear inspiration for yeah. the tone and and then the the lore. Like, it's a fun little game. It's very addictive. It's dirt cheap. You can get it for like two dollars, and you will play hours and hours of it. So, I recommend it in that sense. But Do we know who's making this. The work, like what network studio? No networks around like that. No, it's just the the company that's teaming. I with can the see. I can see this kind of them wanting to this to be a rival to Netflix's Castlevania. I guess. I, I, you know, I, I, it's hard to be excited for this because I feel like you're using it. This is like when they make the Battleship movie. I'm like, well, it's just the name. It's like, it's like a Hot Wheels movie. Yeah, like it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully it's good. And maybe they'll, they'll have, they're saying it's, you know, comedic. So maybe they're going for more of like a, a way kind of thing. Maybe but, they'll add Rihanna to it as well. But, uh, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, that's that. Uh, so we'll get into the rest of the rest of the shows here, the dramas and whatnot. Um, first up, Paramount Television Studios are working on a new Galaxy Quest TV show. So this is not the first time we've talked about a TV show based on Galaxy Quest. Um, notably, it, this was going to happen a few years ago with the original cast, and it was going to be a sequel to the movie. And sadly, the only reason why it didn't happen is because it was they were all on board is that Alan Rickman passed away. And if you can't have one of the main cast, they all basically decided then we shouldn't do it. Uh, now, of course, because they're they're wanting to do a Galaxy Quest show, now it's different. Now it's this is going to be a new cast. It's going to be the same principal concept of the movie, obviously, but we're going to you know go for it. now. Admittedly, um, what it doesn't say here because there's very there's not a lot of details yet. But there's two possibilities here for what they might do with this show. That was my immediate question, right. which one are they taking? Because the whole point of Galaxy Quest is that there was a Star Trek-style TV show called Galaxy Quest, and the movie's about the actors from that show getting involved in a really alien thing years later when they're all past their prime. But it's a really sweet story. It's a love letter to like fandom and what fandom means to people. And, you know, it's a really good movie. It's actually a f- wonderful film. I can't recommend it enough. Fantastic. So there's two things they can do here. Is this set, like, in the, the quote-unquote the real world of its universe where we're following the actors who are making this show, or maybe it's after the show, like the movie, or are they doing the show that these characters made? I, th- I think it's really tough because if it's the the first one there that you say, you know, the, the quote-unquote real world, it's the actors. I think that's the thing that makes Galaxy Quest unique. I think this one makes a Galaxy Quest, basically. I, right, yeah. I, and again, like, if they set it when they're actually making the show, I could see how it works. Like, I could see how you do the stories revolving around them making a show, and, you know, you almost have, like, the, the, like I don't want to say the office style, but almost an office style side well, of it where... More specifically, I think I'm getting shades of 30 Rock from this description. Ah, okay, a bit of 30 Rock. But at the same time, though, if they wanted to actually have stakes, like, because the movie actually had stakes because there was real aliens coming and they had to get involved in it. In fact, you know, the whole joke of the movie is that this group of aliens come seeking the help because they think the TV show is, like, real. They think it's a documentary. So they get the cast thinking, oh, they're, like, they're Starfleet. They're they're the Enterprise. They're going to go save us. And it's a bunch of actors who are like, uh... If you want that element to it as well, which is some of it's real now, then it would maybe have to be set later... Yeah, and then my problem is if they make it just, it's the in-universe show, right, which is the other option. But it's just a Star Trek knockoff at that point. Uh, uh, but uh, even more specifically, I think it's just an Orville knockoff, which is awful to say. Oh, at, at this point in time, yeah. So If they make it now, right now, like, especially with the tone I assume they'd have to strike, 
But yeah, I just, well, might as well just watch the Orville. I mean, my assumption for the show that we're going to make a few years ago would be that, obviously it was all the cast coming back, is that they'd been making the reboot of the show and that something real happened again. So if you did like a one season thing, you'd have a story where maybe the aliens come back, there's another big threat, and this time they make the choice knowing they're going into real danger to do it again because they're heroes now, right? They've actually earned that yeah. status. So I think my hope would be is that whether it's while they're making the show or it's later, like the movie, that there, ha- I think there has to be like no some of the real thing shows up to like get them involved in that. Whether whether if you're effectively just doing like a TV remake of the movie, which I don't even think is a bad idea, honestly. If you're starting with a new cast, I think it's fine it's to not do that. A little bit bland and kind of safe, but. I can see how it works. Yeah, but I think the, I think the idea is though is that okay, that's season one, but season two is what se- the, the show would have been a few years ago if they'd done it, where you can continue it then and okay, what I happens think, yeah. next? I would also like hope you can really expand on something like you can, especially. I mean, it was very good for its time when it was made. I think now specifically, you can do a really interesting take on what it says about fandom. Yeah, I also I think, think there's value in remaking it just for that because fandom has changed. Yeah, fandom's grown a lot over the because that was 1999. We're in a post-internet world now, all that stuff. But yeah. I also think that doing a TV show means that you can riff on types of episodes. You can do a bottle episode and have like satire about a bottle episode. You yeah. can you know do the time loop episode and have them you know satirizing time loop but epi- you can do all the sort of tropey episodes that you would get in a star trek like show and have them focus on that concept for an episode as opposed to the movie which goes through a lot of concepts and they're all really well done but you've got two hours you don't have that much time to like delve into the, the deep end of some of the specifics you know th- there's a lot of opportunity there so i mean we don't know who's writing it yet we don't know um, no one's writing it yet yeah <laughs> well true yeah there's a way to strike but uh yeah so i think there's a lot of potential for this there's a lot of like places you could go with the galaxy quest tv show in a way that other things that can come back i don't think have much to offer this does have some interesting concepts that because it is riffing on real things and trends and there's been so much stuff since 1999 that it can sort of add to its like repertoire that and there was so much even from before then that they didn't get a chance to explore because again they only had two hours there's a lot of material you can do with this i think it's why the idea of a sequel show with the original cast kind of would work, would have worked at the time yeah. is because, like I say, it's, it's a different world. There is, it, it's not you know, redoing the same beats as before, but there is new things to say about those themes. I mean, hell, that uh, was right around the time Force Awakens was coming. So like, it was right at the time of like bringing back the old cast for your sci-fi thing. Yeah. Like they, they, they could have like linked into that so easily. And, and it would have been, Easy, and I'm sure they st- they can still do that, if especially if they're doing it set after the show, like again, like the movie was. If they're still doing that kind of setting for that, you can still play that of oh hey maybe we you know there's there's talk of a reboot you know, yeah. you know in in you know in universe that you can still play with all those beats. Maybe, maybe that's the thing you do is it, there's talk of a reboot and they're kind of all like uh, whatever, and then there is a real thing that happens, and that's the reboot is essentially season two. Yeah, I wonder if, um, because the original movie was meant to be like R-rated and they famously edited it down to get a PG, and to be, to, to a credit to that movie and the editors, it never feels like it hurts because of it. It actually still works oh. perfectly. Uh, it's a but there's, flawless. there's one really laughable moment where they've clearly dubbed like a different word over an F-bomb and it's really obvious once you've noticed it, but yeah. I, I do wonder because it's on Amazon now, but, well, it actually may not be, that, that's where the show was going to be before <laughs> the, you know, the yeah. other reboot, but uh, this could end up somewhere else, but I do wonder if they get to go a bit more R-rated with it this one. Just you know, have a bit of swearing, have them behind the scenes, you know, complaining about I, the scripts. I kind of hope, in, in some ways, like that it is because I think there's a nice dichotomy of having it be you know see clips from this hyper-produced network-style show of yeah. this is a Star Trek show and it's all clean and friendly, and then you have the behind the scenes of of just them. And honestly, this the more I think about it, the more I want the reboot part. Because I think you can show, especially in a, in a very specifically post Trek, post New Trek world, you know, in the last few years of this very different style of Trek that we've gotten now, this more adult, mature, you know, edgy. I say, I say, I say adult, mature. It's not. It's teenage. It's edgy Trek. Oh yeah, if we get a character complaining that there's too much lens flares on their new set or something stupid like that. Yeah, but like, like, like compared, like I mean, you, you if you look at 
Star Trek Discovery versus Next Gen. They're so different shows. I think you can play with that in in a Galaxy Quest show and in a original show and then a reboot kind of again, but playing on that same jump in styles that audiences expect now. And I think there's a lot they could actually say about that potentially. Yeah. Uh, a lot of potential, uh, so hopefully it, it comes to fruition and lands in a way that's got the quality to back it up. So, Twilight. <laughs> Wait, you no. know how I mean, you're not doing this to me. <laughs> you know how like Twilight died. kind of existed because Harry Potter was successful, and that kind of ushered in a lot of these young adult book properties being adapted to, into movie franchises. Some, some better than others, right? Uh, you know. Harry Potter led to Twilight, which led to Divergence and Maze Runner and... Oh, hey, you overlooked Hunger Games. Hunger there. Games, yeah, yeah. So let's tell those. I think it's really funny that literally just a couple weeks after, oh, we're doing Harry Potter again as a TV show. Would you believe it? They're doing Twilight again as a TV show. There's new Hunger Games coming as well. I don't know if, you know, if you're aware of that. There's a new movie, yes. It, and it looks... Yeah. It, it looks like one of the Divergent or Maze Runner sequels to me. It doesn't look like Hunger Games. I haven't Games. seen anything about the movie it's, I just know that the, the book came out not not All that right. long ago and just so it's still she wrote a new book to yeah. be fair like, you know, the, it's the, based on that the quality looks more akin to the other young adults not, not that Hunger Games was super high quality but it it stood out versus in the that other world ones. it was yeah. pretty near the top let's be fair at least the first couple were yeah this the trailer for the new one makes it look it just belongs with the other young oh, adult movies shame. uh Again, just based on the trailer, but you know, it's a couple of young CW style actors, and you know. which, again, to be fair, you could have said that about the original one at no, the think, time. Well, not really, because I think Jennifer Lawrence like instantly gave it a bit of cred. She was a nobody at that time, relative nobody, but she didn't just come across as a CW. Like, I'm saying, I watched this trailer and they just feel like bland CW, they're just yeah, pretty people, fair enough. you know, fair enough. Um. But anyway, so Twilight uh, TV show is in the works. Um, it's an early development at Lionsgate Television. Stephanie Meyer is expected to be involved, which again, sounds exactly like the Harry Potter show <laughs> that's coming. Yeah. Uh, there's no writer attached to the project yet. No point in rushing to that, given, <laughs> given the current state of things. Um, We're going to make that joke on everything apparently, that yeah. comes out in the next uh, like, six months. So Lionsgate uh, is not yet sort out a partner and by partner i assume they mean a network or distributor service. of some sort yes, yes. To, 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 but i'm sure they they'll don't, get they don't, it they don't have their own thing do they or anywhere that they own inherently uh, that would make sense why is it they don't own stars i don't know if they still own stars yeah oh, that's what i mean but I, I don't think they'd want this on stars right that's a bit yeah. more yeah i say adult. again adult in the edgy sense but probably aged up beyond where they're aiming a Twilight series at. There's enough of a name recognition with Twilight, sadly, that they'll definitely find a home for it. I'm oh, not... All I'm saying is, if there's no baseball scene set to Muse, it's failed. <sighs> this is the only scene I can actually remember from all... F I've, I've seen all of those movies. All of them. All five? Yes, I've seen five, all five yeah. of those movies. And I can remember one scene. Yeah, I uh, I've not seen the last one yet. Uh, th when Tim's Get. back from paternity leave, we'll have to do it on screams. Uh, unfortunately, we owe the people that, but uh, there's one left though. Four out the way, just one left. I can I can I can do one last measure. I don't remember it being a good one. <laughs> I don't imagine it's going to be now. <laughs> um, what what part twos are all, are ever a good one? Uh, I don't know. Godfather part two, <laughs> maybe. You know full well I meant part two is in the trend of this splitting your final movie into two, not just the name of your second movie. Yeah. Or Last of Us Part Two, if a video game example. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's yeah. good part two. Is. Look, look, you're following the letter of the law, but not the spirit, and I don't appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, all right. Obviously, we have nothing to say on Twilight. We hate it. It's fine. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, so. Nick Puzzolato, who wrote the first few seasons of True Detective, who notably actually is the guy that just hired to write the Blade movie that I mentioned earlier. Uh, oh, I did. I, I, do you know what? Uh, I saw that he was hired to write yeah. that. I didn't see the update. Now that you, you mentioned his name, yeah. Yeah. Um, which honestly is not a good sign. Uh, yeah, I, I, I groaned when I saw... No, no, I care about that Blade movie anyway at this point, but I groaned anyway because... He's not a good writer. I'm just going to... <laughs> True, True Detective Season 1 is good in spite of his writing, not yes. because of it. And Season 2 just revealed 
exactly <laughs> how bad his writing was without yeah. anything to cover it up. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so Nick Pazzolato was working on a Western for Amazon, right? And it's pivoted, right? The, he was working on an mm. original Western and they've went to him and said, hey, we own the Magnificent Seven. Can you do a Magnificent Seven show instead of a, an original Western? And he's basically went, yeah, all right. <laughs> so... Did, did we not talk about a Magnificent Seven thing, like, recently? I think we talked about it because it, when a few weeks ago, Amazon had their big list of IP that they have from MGM that they want to try and do something. Maybe with. that's why it came yeah. up. Yeah. So this is this is kind of the uh, they found where they wanted to do yeah. something. This is the next chapter of the Magnificent yeah. Seven I saw this chapter. Headline. I saw the headline. I was like, I swear we spoke about something to do with this a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It came up with a bunch of other uh, things. Oh, that'll be it. Casually, yeah. but uh, so yeah, he was making a, a Western for Amazon. Um, obviously, this is. Magnificent Seven originally was based on Seven Samurai, which is seven cowboys in this case are assembled to protect a town from bandits or, you know. It's what? a very simple premise. Simple premise. Um, seven Samurai is a masterpiece. It is a 10 out of 10 film. Um, and as I said last time, the only good adaptation since has been A Bug's Life. Sure. I mean, I mean it's better than Magnificent Seven. I'll give you that. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's turned into this reboot, this IP reboot. Because uh, obviously they want to use all these things. Um, it is worth mentioning Pizzolatto Puzz actually co-wrote the 2016 movie remake uh, that starred Denzel Washington and Ethan Hawke. I never saw that, but I didn't realize. I, he I was... did. I saw it. It was fine. Yeah. Like, I, I, as I feel about the original Magnificent Seven movie, honestly, I think it's yeah, oh, it's fine as well. Uh, the remake, it, it wasn't a bad movie. I, I you know, I don't think it was a standout, but well, it wasn't well, terrible. It's hard. It's hard to mess up such a simple premise, right? What's so funny is I just watched Seven Samurai in the last week for a thing i should uh, rewatch it and you know one of the things that obviously it says up all the characters as the character is very much the heart of it and it's got a lot of subtext and themes because it's talking about class systems and people like not being allowed to leave their own class and all the right and it's very rich a very rich film which is why it's so, so spectacular and but every other version has absolutely none of that depth but on top of all that though and this is something i also think i don't remember Minister seven having this is that there's a lot of like okay how are we going to defend the town? Here's the plan. Here's the rules. Here's where we're going to block off things and yada yada. Like, there's a lot of I, strategy in the movie that I don't one, know if... I think there's a lot of that in Bugs Life from what I remember. <laughs> okay. Uh, two, I actually think the remake from a few okay. years ago does have more of that than the original. Okay. Uh, and, and like I say, it, it's... If, if you decide that, you know, you want to put that movie on, because I'm sure it's streaming somewhere, probably Amazon, let's be honest, um... You're not going to have a bad time. Like It's not a, you know, it, it, it's such a simple premise. It's hard to really get it horrifically wrong. It's it's a very watchable movie. It's just nothing that you should spend your time on if you've got anything else to watch. Yeah. And if you want an in-depth analysis of Seven Samurai, towards the end of the month or over in Male Fuzz Movies, uh, a new monthly series called Collector's Cut, The Collection begins uh, in the first oh episode. Are you, are you doing a Kurosawa series? Well, Criterion series. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, That's... It's a little bit different, but yeah. The, the, but there will be Kurosawa probably once every six months or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. You, you, let me know when you get to the best one. What's the best one? Well, it's not Seven Samurai. Clearly, is is my opinion, which is maybe a slightly unpopular opinion already. I mean, different people have different favorites. I I want to say yours is is yours Red Beard. No. 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 It's why the Shakespeare throwing, adaptations in it, though. It is Shakespeare adaptations. It's Throne of Blood. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because yeah. he's got three it's that... The one that's yeah. I think I liked Ran more than those two, as far as the Shakespeare adaptations go. But I like Ran a lot as well, to be fair. Right, Ran's very, very good. But yeah. Uh, but yes, yeah, so if you want some classy... Basically, the, the, that, that show came about because... Uh, you know, so I did a collector's cut with David over in Male Fuzz Movies. And we'd worked through franchises, worked through, you know, themes. Like, we did 70s disaster season, things like that. Um, but we were starting to get a little bit ahead in the recording. Uh, and we, we've got a monthly show on Patreon, which is us doing the worst of the worst. But hopefully good, bad, which is... And now you want to do the best of the best. Yeah, basically, this is the flip of that show. We were doing the best of the best, which is Criterion movies. So, uh, yeah. So the first episode of that is uh, towards the end of the month. Uh, so go, go to Sonner over, check it out. Uh, but anyway, uh, so that was the Magnificent Seven show. Which, again, Pizzolatto's not a good writer, but 
it's a simple premise, even he shouldn't be able to screw up too badly. If they get a good cast and a good director, they could true detective the hell out of it and actually create a good season of TV. And I suppose if you're doing, you know, multiple seasons, then after season one is basically just a, a reinterpretation of the, the original story. But then season two, I imagine, oh, they're now a team who go about and like find more people to protect or something, you know? Yeah, there's, there's, there's ways you can take that. Yeah. Uh, next up, another cinematic universe is blossoming, and that is the Anne Rice cinematic universe. <laughs> I did not expect that. <laughs> so they've already got uh, Anne Rice's interview with the vampire and Anne Rice's Mayfair Witches. I watched the first episode of Mayfair Witches. Uh, can't say I recommend it. I mean, I've heard very good things about Interview with a Vampire. If you really like looking at Alexander Daddario, then that's that's the well, best I thing. I guess you've got. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> that's 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 the best thing I can say about it. Uh, but that, that's you know, I, I, I didn't like it otherwise. So they're doing a third Anne Rice show. Uh, so I don't think it's I don't know if it's I don't know if it's got a, a title necessarily yet. Although it's probably just. Uh, the Talamasca. Oh, what's, what's the name of the book? <laughs> Talamasca. Or the Order of the Talamasca. I don't know, it's probably just one of those. Anyway, the series is set in the world of Talamasca, a secret of organization featured in a number of Racy's novels. Uh, comes from the blindside writer John Lee Hancock, who is attached as showrunner and writer. The Talamasca, uh, which is otherwise known as the Order of the Talamasca, features in both uh, Vampire Chronicles and Mayfair Witches. So this is not like a, its own book. This is, this is something that's been in multiple of her books yeah yeah I'm, I'm getting shades of uh less stuff that you get in like stephen king's yeah. books right uh it's a secret society set up to research watch over and keep track of the paranormal including witches spirits werewolves and vampires race calls them psychic detectives uh so that's the thing um so it's bprd the other two shows have just both uh, been renewed for se second seasons recently so you know Are they all on the same network uh what's a good question uh, Mayfair Witches, I think, was AMC. That sounds right. And maybe the other maybe one was too. Like, I feel like yeah. it was. It wasn't a streaming service. I'm, I'm sure of that. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what I don't know. Uh, do you know what's so weird about this is that a lot of these subject matters are the sort of things that appeal to me because I, you know, I like horror stuff. I like vampires. I like you know werewolves and and whatnot. But there's kind of almost this like, and the Twilight kind of factors out of this as well. Is that there's almost this kind of romantic teen version of all these things that is like taking it and doing something very different with it for a very different audience which i'm i think i've as i've gotten a bit older than you know that i was when like like when twilight was coming out for example are you coming up in 30 please don't remind me it's all i get at work every goddamn day is you're 30 next year you're 30 next year it's like just bloody no shut up i don't really need reminding by all you bloody 18 and 19 year olds Ugh. Uh huh. Uh, Don't worry, it's not on my mind or anything. As I was saying, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm more okay with it in that as long as they're still making other things that are to my taste oh, no, as well. Like I wasn't even complaining. I, I it's just it's fascinating to me that I I can't think of any other like thing I like where there's like a second sort of type of it that is just so not for me that is like on the other you know it's this this uh trashy romance kind of novel version of like the thing i like like yeah you know like don't get me wrong obviously there's lots of other things i like where there's examples of, like you know I, I love alien monster movies set in space there's bad versions of that but they're not they're not bad because but they're still aiming for you yeah they're just you bad as an audience, yeah. they're just badly made whereas yeah. there's a whole kind of like romantic style of vampire specifically that is just and and to be fair, there always has been. This has been. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. This is not a new phenomenon. Like you know, we mentioned uh, it's repopularized with Twilight, sure, but this style of specifically with vampires, but it's kind of spiraled out from there towards you know other uh, witches, fairies, things like that. Yeah. This this is going back to like to, to Dracula, right? You know that this it's you know it broke off kind of right at the start of the genre. I just think it's interesting. It's just I, I can't think of anything I'll say I like where there's just like a, an alternate take on it. So there's but like not just one alternate take, but an alternate take that's so consistent that it's basically its own genre. You know, like it's just constant. There's always this version of this thing over yeah. in a parallel lane, and it's like it's a 
completely valid version in its own right and it's 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 i think it's what's weird about it is it's so recognizable because it plays with the same tropes the genre side of it plays with the same tropes ultimately you know it's the same kind of you know the same superstitions the same you know ideas that it plays yeah, with but the rating it just uses them in a completely different. different way yeah yeah no it's just it's just that you know you get the moral instruments all that shit as well fits into this and i don't actually know what the moral instruments is about is that vampires is that I, I don't know I, I, I think there's vampires in that I'm going to tell you what, I, I have no idea. Because a, a long time ago, we did a pilot for Shadowhunters, which was the TV was that version Marlin? of it. I remember that, watching that episode of Shadowhunters. Yeah, yeah. Vague, I mean, I don't remember anything yet, but I remember watching it. That, that was what that was, yeah. I'm, I am like 99% certain there are copies of those Marlin Instruments books out on the bookshelf in the other room that Paige has. <laughs> And I've never once gone, ooh, I'll, re I'll give that a try. No, I'll, I'll see what it's about. <laughs> I love how you've backed up the earlier claim of Paige having shit taste with, oh, she's got some Mortal Instruments books on the shelf. <laughs> yes. But also, that, that was more specifically about she, she likes a lot of network procedurals because mm. they're easy to watch and, you, you know, you just put them on, which I get. Um, this, this, I think, is slightly different in that I don't think it's inherently shit taste. I think this is, again, not exclusively, but a large part of this divide that we're talking about on this, this genre stuff is uh, aimed towards men and aimed towards women, respectively. Mm. Again, not exclusively. People enjoy what they'd like. You know, I'm sure there are plenty of women who like the quote-unquote male versions of this and, and vice versa. But I think they're targeted at and marketed towards those demographics, respectively. <sighs> I agree with that to an extent. I, w I will say, I don't necessarily like that, even though, yeah, obviously they market the romance trashy stuff yeah. to, to women more. They obviously do. That's what they're aiming for. But I don't like designating it as the male and female versions I... because I feel like, again, not that the, the male side, if you will, is always good because no, there's a lot of shit no, of over there. There's, there's shit right. versions in both and, and right. presumably good versions in both. Um, But I, 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 do, I do think that... <sighs> It is like more of a like you say it's the female side. I I I would say it's more the female teenager side than it is. You know, it, it's, I, I, it's aimed I, very well, specifically at you know like twelve I, and thirteen to, year olds. It's just that to, again to some extent I agree with when, when we get towards like uh, mall insurance stuff like that. That's that's firmly YA territory, but Anne Rice I don't think is. Oh no, true. Anne, Anne Rice is uh, yeah definitely not as young as that, but. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that, like, I, th I think there's a... I would say the quality, like, average is definitely better on one side over the other. While I want to agree with you, <laughs> right? are, are we biased by our own appeal towards one inherently one side? <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were going to say or, or, but biased by our appearances, but no, no. <laughs> I mean, right. if you wanted to take it that way. <laughs> no, no. Well, because what I'm saying is, because, like... I think the problem with designated is one's the male approach and one's the female approach is that I don't necessarily think that completely tracks when, you know, to me, the best vampire movie of all time is Let the Right One In. And it's a, it's a prestigious, like, well-made movie. And I wouldn't say it's specifically aimed at men. It's just, it's just a, a serious vampire story that's, that's very... Mm -hmm. But if anything, I would say that there's a lot of interesting themes in it that it probably would appeal to, to a woman's audience and what it does with the idea of this young looking girl vampire she's not yeah. really young she's you know hundreds of years old but uh but the idea of how she like lures in the trust of men around her there's a lot of really deep interesting themes of what it's playing with there and then you've got other vampire stories of various kinds there's, there's so much variety on what you would call the male side like let the right one in versus near dark versus uh you know nosferatu like they're all there's a lot more variety and i think it boils down to because what you're calling the female side is specifically the romance vampire and for the most part i would say kind of trashy and i don't mean that in a bad way i just that's just kind of what it is there's like a there's not an effort to make them be like prestigious or serious like in-depth studies of characters they're supposed to be trashy romance and that's fine if that's what it is but i think that's why comp saying that one's the male side one's the female side is a bit disingenuous because there's so much variety on the other side that i don't think is really geared towards one specific audience i want to make this very clear is that 
I don't disagree with anything you're saying. I'm not saying one of them is inherently male and female. I think I think they have been marketed that way and therefore they have already been assigned that way by studios and the, the people not, oh, not yeah. necessarily like the creatives making them, but like the, the the larger system as a whole, they are designated that way, which is why I kinda use those terms. Yeah, yeah. I I just it's uh I mean, we're, just, we're not really arguing at that here other than just, like... It's very much literary semantics at this point. Yeah, yeah. I, it's just, you know, there's, there's so much variety on the... I feel bad saying the proper vampire side, but, like, all of the good ones are on that side. There's a lot of bad ones on that side, but, like, you know, like, it's more serious attempts to have a scary vampire or have a, a story or, or something like the Transfiguration, which is this sort of thing that uses the vampire idea, but in a really sort of grounded and... Like it's like a a character study and a study of uh, this young black uh, teenager who's obsessed with vampires and thinks he is a vampire and how it's this coping mechanism for the world around him and how what his life and it's this really great little character drama that also happens to feed into vampire ideas and I'm like that's not appealing to like vampire horror fans necessarily that's just a good thing that's, that's using vampires yeah. Uh, yeah another example of something along those lines I would say is um. A girl walks home alone at night. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's a pure stale movie. That that's like there's there's very little narrative depth to that, and I'm and that's not a complaint because it's a wonderful it's a looking gorgeous movie. movie. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, we've we've uh, we don't care about Anne Rice's show. <laughs> that's, that's that's the, the key well, thing. Annoyingly, I think this is the one I'm the most interested in. Oh, okay. on premise, I think that especially as a TV show, I think that sounds. Like, it's it already fits the 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 mold of a typical network show, right? For, you know, and, and I mean that in a in a good way, like the good network shows that you know that we you know used to like. Not that we don't like them anymore, but they, they don't really make as much anymore. I, I hesitate to to name any names, but uh, you know we're all thinking some, and I think this can very easily fit that mold of like, oh, it's it's inbuilt to its premise of why this will work as a TV show. I. Think, that probably makes it the one that's the most appealing to me to try as a TV show, as opposed to just, I'll just go read some of the books, the other ones. Mm. All right, Netflix's Greenlight, Akira Knightley starring Thriller. Uh, it comes from the Crown producer, Left Bank, and uh, a Bank of Dave sequel. Uh, unveiled at a showcase in London, uh, Netflix introduced Black Doves from Chernobyl producer Sister, which is written by Joe Barton and as Kira Knightley is an executive producer. The show stars Knightley as Helen, who embarks on a passionate affair with a man who has no idea what her secret identity is. Caught in the crosshairs when her lover falls victim to the dangerous and shadowy London underworld, Helen's employer, Colin Sam, to protect her. That got more generic as it went on. <laughs> it, it, it really did. Um, yeah. I think it's an interesting role for Kieran Knightley because I don't really think of her as doing thrillers very often. She, she doesn't. I think she's probably unfortunately been pretty typecast as the, uh, the oh, period, period drama. Yeah, woman. period drama. I, I, I picture Kieran Knightley. I picture in a frothy dress with a corset and a big. Skirt. She's very good at that. Let's be fair to her. Like, it's you know, she can't, she gets cast as that a lot for a reason, and it's because she's very good at it. They just tend to be things that don't appeal to us very much. She's probably like, please, I want you to not wear a corset ever again in my life. Yeah. I don't even want to get fat. I just want you to put on like two pounds. <laughs> That's yeah, all. Yeah. That's all I want. <laughs> um, Netflix has given a series order to a new supernatural mystery from executive producers Matt and Ross Duffer titled The Burrows. So obviously the Duffers uh, behind Stranger Things. Uh, they're just producing this, but it's created by Jeffrey Addis and Will Matthews. It's an eight-episode drama set in the seemingly picturesque retirement community in the New Mexico desert, where a group of unlikely heroes must band together to stop an otherworldly threat from stealing the one thing they don't have, time. So what I'm getting from this is Stranger Things meets Bubba Hotep, and I'm like, yes! <laughs> Perfect idea! <laughs> I can see that vibe, yeah. Um... yeah. It's a bunch of old people in the retirement home, and some like supernatural forces try to like steal their souls or something, and they're like, F this, we're fighting back. That's what this sounds like to me. Yeah, I I'm I'm picturing like they're literally going against the Grim Reaper, right? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. It's like if if it's if it's time, it's like they're, they're just they're holding death at bay, right? It essentially, is the mm. vibe. I can see that being fun in that show. 
I, I, I can see that being good. You know, eight episodes. I, it, it, it very much does feel like, okay, Stranger Things was kids, so we're going to go opposite with this. We're going let's, to go the, let's go the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, Duffer's execution with Hell, I Leave It via their company Upside Down Pictures. You know, Netflix going to leverage the hell out of the fact that they've oh, got yeah. them. Just, you know, even, even if they're not involved in the show at all, really, they'll be like, ah, but from the same people who brought you Stranger Things, come on, you guys want to check this out? Cause... Yeah. So Addison Matthews, who are running the show, they developed the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance on Netflix. So... Which obviously didn't get its particularly strong viewings, but it was very well regarded by yeah, people, people liked who it, yeah. watched it. Like, people loved that show. Like, I, I, I mean, I tried I to... I, I wasn't into the first episode of it, but it just wasn't for me. But it wasn't because like the writing was necessarily bad. It was I just... liked the first episode a lot more than you because it appeals to me inherently. I never went back and watched it, but I'm not... like, Hey, I'll check out more of their stuff if they do it because I, I think you know, it was definitely well made. Yeah, so as the Burrows... Sounds kind of promising, honestly. So it's one of the more interesting things Netflix have announced and. Quite some time for me. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Netflix, they've also uh, announced Bandidos, a thriller series about an underwater heist. Okay, okay. You put underwater in front of heist. I'm, I'm mildly <laughs> heists curious. are always. Uh, they have an inherent fondness to, to heist films, and I assume TV shows as well. Yeah. The drama follows the story of Miguel and accomplice uh, Lily, who are joined by a group of bandits as they attempt to retrieve treasure from an underwater grave of a Spanish galleon that sunk off the Gulf of Mexico during the War of Independence. However, they are not the only ones after the bounty. Uh, so I think notably this is going to be mainly a Spanish language series. I think this is like a, uh, one of their international productions. Uh, Pablo Tabar is going to write and be showrunner on the eight-part series, uh, which will apparently feature a massive underwater heist. So I'm, I'm getting shaded. Was it, is, it, is Money Heist the one that they have? Oh, yeah, I think they did that, yeah. Yeah, which is a good, another foreign language one. I, I, for some reason, I feel like that was Spanish as well. I could be wrong, though. I don't, I don't, think, think, I don't think Money Heist was. Am I not thinking of the right show? I might I, be having the, the, wrong, the name wrong. Money Heist, I don't think it was a movie you're thinking of. No. There's, there's, there's a TV show that Netflix did. I don't deny there's a TV show, but I think Money Heist was a movie Netflix did. I could be... I mean, maybe I'm misremembering. I, I, oh man, it's gonna annoy the hell out of me. What that was called? <laughs> I mean, don't have a whole lot to go on. Uh, anyway, so they're doing bandidos. Sounds. I mean, if they give this enough money to do all the underwater stuff, fancily, that could be cool. Uh, the director of the show, though, is the guy who did uh, Rambo: Last Blood and Get the Gringo, which isn't. You know, I've not seen either of those, but I, I haven't heard anything good about either of them. So you know, maybe keep your expectations a little bit in check. Oh, I was right. It's Money Heist, a Spanish show. It's, it had five seasons on Netflix. I don't know if it's still going or not, but there, there have been five seasons. It's. I know in the last like couple of years, like you know, I see like the last couple of seasons, it got it, it really hit a an international audience. You know, you know and well, fair, fair people, enough. A lot of people like that I know were were watching it. And that said, I will say that I'm sure they probably have a movie that's similar to Money Heist in title. <laughs> So I don't think I'm completely I, crazy. I'm, I'm willing to b bet they do, but yeah, yeah. No, and I, I'm guessing this is par partially like, hey, that kind of hit a, a wide audience. Maybe we can kind of get some of that magic going again, uh, especially you know another heist show. Yeah, you know, also in Spanish. Uh, oh, I, I can see why they might want that. So yeah, uh, that's that. Next up, we have the Shards, uh, which is a podcast and a novel, which is in works as a TV show. Uh, at HBO. Uh, so the shards is from Brett Easton Ellis. Uh, he will executive produce and write this along with Nick Hall and Brian Young. Uh, the shards takes a tracks a group of privileged Los Angeles high school friends as a serial killer strikes across the city set in 1981. Uh, the podcast dropped last year on Ellis's Patreon and not published the book on January 17th. So we've got a nice big description here as well to go into a bit more detail. 17-year-old Brett is a senior at the executive, sorry, the exclusive Buckley Prep School when a new student arrives with a mysterious past. Robert Mallory is a bright, handsome, charismatic, and shielding a secret from Brett and his friends, even as he becomes part of their tightly knit circle. 
Brett's obsession with Mallory is equaled only by his increasingly unsettling preoccupation with the trawler, a serial killer on the list who seems to be drawing ev ever closer to Brett and his friends, taunting them, and Brett in particular, with grotesque threats and horrific sharply local acts of violence. The coincidences are uncanny, but they are also filtered through the imagination of a teenager whose gifts for constructing narrative from the filaments of his own life are about to make him one of the most explosive literary sensations of his generation. Can he trust his friends or his mind to make sense of the danger they appear to be in? Thwarted by the world and his own innate desires, uh, buffeted by unhealthy fixations, and his spirals into paranoia and isolation as the relationship between the trawler and Robert Mallory hurtles inexorably towards collision. So, big, big way of describing it there. a long description, yeah. Um, I get it, you know, I, I enjoyed... Uh, summer of 81 i think no it was 78 maybe it was summer of 78 but it was like a you know people said oh maybe it's a bit too stranger things because it's a group of kids and there's like a serial killer on the list but i i felt it did some interesting things that made it worth the the watching i think doing a period piece with teenagers dealing with a serial killer is definitely the type of vibe that appeals to a lot of people uh i can be into it if it's done well yeah so i you know, obviously this being a podcast and then a book means that clearly there's a premise here that worked for an audience and then has worked for a second audience and presumably might now work for a third audience, a much bigger audience. No so. reason to assume it won't, yeah. And HBO? That's a fairly prestigious place to, to put it's this. because we've, we've seen at this point quite a few places pick up things from podcasts. I don't remember HBO doing any so far. I could be yeah. wrong on that though because obviously there's been quite a lot, but... And given it as a, a podcast and a book, I, I imagine, you know, at least if it isn't going to just be a limited show, then season one would be the story of the, the whole thing that that's currently exists. Yeah. So, uh, no, very interesting. But hey, there's, there's no reason why a narrative podcast can't, you know, become a good TV show. No, it, uh, it's, it's obviously they, they are constructed with audio in mind, um, but... It's, but they're also episodic it, as well, which they are, translates yeah, and, uh, to be easy I, to I TV. listen to, you know, my fair share of them at this point. Um, and I don't think... There's no inherent reason not that they shouldn't be adapted or can't. I think it's... There's as much work involved as adapting from that than there is from a book, uh, I would say. Because, you know, the... It's the, same, the book's got dialogue, it's got, see, you know, it's got scenes, it's got settings. But you still have to do different things for TV. And the, the same is true in audio, um, but there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to be adapted well. Like, again, I'm sure there'll be good and bad adaptations of various ones, but there's nothing inherent in them. Yeah. It's interesting, though, because we're at a point now where doing a new IP as a movie or a show or even a video game is really hard, right? Because they're, they're, they're very expensive. It's hard to, like, bank on them. So it's interesting that these new formats, like podcast books, are always going to be there, and they've they've been there. they're the oldest medium, basically. But podcasts are another new avenue where someone can create a story that catches an audience and then can be turned into the more expensive version in a in a show or a movie it's, or whatever. It's quite funny how it's gained a new life. Uh, you know, we talk of them as podcasts now because that's the format they're being released in, more specifically. Like they're, they're released on a podcast app as opposed to actually being podcasts no, it was not so long ago this was what podcasts were you know just to, you know you know people chatting right like, like a radio show yeah essentially whereas now it has depending on who you ask it has one of these two very different meanings whereas it, i think it's, it's so because we already had a name for these new style of podcasts you know you know the, 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 the audio dramas or radio plays like they, they've existed for a hundred years yeah, but I mean, radio, especially once TV came into prominence, radio became the smaller thing. It became the more niche. They thing. did, but these have—I mean, these have been popular to to an extent that they are still like uh, on BBC Radio, uh, whichever channel it is. They have the Archers that's been running for like fifty years, every every you know, a couple of times a week. Oh sure, but here's the thing though: is that the, the reason why you're calling that a podcast is because podcast with podcast comes some things that you don't get on something that's broadcast on radio. You get freedom to go back and listen to it whenever you want to. You can yeah. start whatever one you want. You get, like, all these ease of life things 
make it so that you can go back and start it like any you know like binging any tv show where it's not this thing you have to catch at a time it's now again i i, I agree with what you're saying but this is why even before these books we had the term audio drama as opposed to radio play because we had these for decades already before podcasts were a thing with companies like big finish did oh, I don't know, they've been doing doctor who uh audio drama since 1999 i think they've been doing other things before that like so you know, we already had the exact same format of oh we can play these you know you can stop start you've got that freedom we, we that's why they started calling them audio dramas but you know the access to them was much more limited i assume you had to go and buy them specifically because you're interested Yes. Right. Now but, it's because they're in a podcast app. Yeah, they're in an app. You yeah. can search, you can try things, you can do all these things. Yeah. Like the audience for a podcast, especially now, I imagine is way bigger than any of these things back in the day would have would have had. Like, oh, got, almost. Um, yeah. Potentially, yeah. Like everyone could go buy it if they wanted to, but no, they weren't. Like I've never heard of these things. And that, that just, you know, stands, stands to the reason that they're not as well widespread or well known or, or whatever. So, um, it just makes yeah. sense that much like rating, you know, a comic, which again is a lot more low investment versus, a, you know, a movie or a TV or anything like that. There's these, like, these mediums where the new IP is being created and then it's been farmed by the bigger things to create content out of. That seems to be the way things are going more and more often these days because launching something that's completely new, unless you're a name like a Christopher Nolan who can say, I'm going to do a movie called Inception and... Warner Brothers will bend over and give me whatever I want because I'm Christopher F. and Nolan. <laughs> Unless yeah. you're at that stage, it's really hard to actually get a new thing made with a budget and all the and rest of it. So. Audio dramas are, on the scale, cheap to produce. Oh, very... Especially as the, the, the scope of them can go from... You can have one person re- you know, essentially doing a narrative it, it could be a, Yeah, it could be a writer just reading the story. If, if, if they feel confident enough to actually you know, tell it with some pizzazz, it can just be a one-person thing that from start to finish. All Some right. of them are that, and they're very good. Yeah. Or you can have full casts, you can have full sounds, music productions. Mm-hmm. You, you know, there's a big scope of what you can have in them. Which, and... while obviously much more than the one-person show, is still infinitely cheaper than any movie or TV show. And it's, I'd say it's easier and more accessible to get than, say, a book. Because, okay, you can self-publish a book. But your audience is hard to get to, right? Yeah. You know, you have programs like uh, Amazon's uh, Kindle Unlimited, where you can get in that, and like you get paid per read. Uh, but again, it's how many people are do you know getting that? And there's a time investment where most people takes you know uh, x amount of time to read a book, whereas okay, here's uh, a podcast episode. It's thirty minutes. You try it. You you don't you like it or not? But you 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 know exactly how long it is going in. Um, you know that commitment is there. It's like trying a, a new episode of a TV show, mm. except it's nine times out of ten, it's free to try these things because people put them out and then monetize them in different ways. And uh, yeah, it makes it very easy for people to to make them and and kind of like I say, you know, farm out new IP essentially. Yeah, no, it's, it's just you get more freedom and creativity because there is less of a risk to it and. As a and result, uh, that's where you get a lot of the new ideas. It is a form I love. I've, I've, I've made a radio play in the past. Um, I would definitely, you know, I'd, I'd do it again. It's fun. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so next up, David Ayer is going to write and executive produce an upcoming racing TV show called Lollipop, alongside partner Chris Long and their Cedar Park Studios. Uh, so what's weird about this, though, is the series will invite audiences to actively participate in a narrative written by Ayer as they compete in a virtual racing circuit linked to the plot. So there's like an interactive element to this between episodes. Bloody bandersnatch again, isn't it? <laughs> the next generation of storytelling experiences will combine elements of episodic streaming, gaming, and professional sports. The show will feature 10 episodes and 10 races set in some of the world's most alluring destinations, highlighted, highlighting local cultures and an integral component in both the narrative and competition. The race will take place in the digital street courses in host cities starting in Los Angeles. The storyline will weave together gamified racing with plot e- events that will impact the cars and conditions in the virtual race circuit. Teams will need to pay close attention to, and adapt to survive if they want to reach the podium at the end of the season. Uh, Lollipop, which will be built using Epic Games on Real Engine 5, will deliver... It's weird that we're talking about Unreal Engine 5 in this, which... What's going on? We both play video games, so we understand all this. I imagine those people listening to this who don't care about video games who are like, what the hell are you talking about? But, anyway, 
Um, so yeah, it sounds like this is all it really says. But so the way I'm interpreting this is that it's ten episodes, but between each episode, there's a race that people compete in in a video game style setting. But the conditions of that race will be affected by whatever the previous episode did. So that's this is just a really like simple example. But let's say in episode one. Oh, lightning struck a tree. There's a tree covering part of the track. So in that race between the next two episodes, they'll have to dodge a tree. That's a really simplified example, but that that's what I'm getting from this. Yeah. <laughs> but then also there's the angle where, from what I gather, it'll actually be a game, obviously, but real people playing the game. Yes. As an actual like competition, as if you were just playing, you know, a racing game but obviously I, anyway. I can't see how that would affect the plot because the actual episodes will have been made already so it's going to have to be done in a way where like the outcomes of the races yeah. don't affect the plot yeah i don't want <laughs> I, yeah I don't I'll, I'll be honest this all sounds like a bit of a mess to me that isn't going to work but maybe i'm being it too sounds cynical. extremely ambitious in a in a in a, in a new format, still yeah. way ambitious. And I don't really like David Ayer stuff that much anyway. So even just on like a basic, I like one of his films a yeah. lot. Well, I say a lot, a, a reasonable amount. Mm. So that's that. Uh, anything can come back because FX have revealed the first look uh, this past couple of weeks to their eight part series, The Full Monty. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah, there's some photos of like Robert Carlyle and stuff like in this. It's a thing. Okay. Uh, it's going to be uh, on Hulu in the US. Um, uh, I don't know. Probably Disney Plus elsewhere, I guess. I'll probably be uh, star on Disney Plus. Uh, yeah. Uh, set 25 years after the film, the eight episode series will follow the same band of brothers as they navigate the post industrial city of Sheffield and society's crumbling healthcare, education, and employment sectors. The comedy drama will uncover what happened to the gang after they put their kit back on, exploring their brighter, sillier, and more desperate moments. It will also. Uh, highlight the how fiercely funny the world of these working class heroes still residing in Sheffield has changed in the intervening decades. I think what baffles me about this is that it's an American network that's funding and making this. Like, did the US like was the film on it like a big deal? In yeah, the US? I, I didn't ever realize it was. I, I didn't think it was. I mean, I, I like it was a relatively big movie when it came out here, but like I don't feel like people talk about it or like remember it that much. No, the the only thing I can even possibly think of is Americans really like Sean Bean's accent, and they're like, <laughs> "Where can we get more of that?" Is he in film money? No, but he's he's from Sheffield. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, fair enough. <laughs> he's got a Sheffield accent, so that that's that's my link here. Yeah. Uh, I'm usually Robert Carlyle, obviously Scottish, but he's not doing a Scottish accent in the movie. I'm sure he's just yeah. doing Sheffield, or his best approximation of the, a Sheffield the generic accent. Yorkshire, probably, yeah. let's be honest. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the Phil Monty, for anyone who doesn't know, the Phil Monty just means naked, and it's it's basically a, a group of regular working class guys who, to try and make money, decide to put on a strip show, and the movies, it's kind of, it kind of, it's kind of like a concert movie where it's just building up to the big show, and they're, they're, they're trying to learn how to dance, and it's all just sort of that, and then at the end, they do their show, and that's it. That's the yeah, it was, it was the original Magic Mike. Basically, yeah, it was the original yeah. early British Magic Mike. Uh, I can't say it. Like, are they going to strip again? I mean, they're all like in their 60s or whatever now. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes it funnier. <laughs> Who's going to see a fair. bunch of 60-year-olds showing their, their wrinkled dicks? <laughs> I don't know, 60-year-old women? <laughs> but, uh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. They all like younger men. They're all in the pearl. Uh, that's true. Yeah, you're right. Cougars and whatnot. Mm. Anyway, uh, next up, The Marvelous Miss Mazelle is wrapping its five-season run, uh, but its Emmy-winning creators Amy Sherman Palladino and Daniel Palladino are prepping their next show. Prime Video was given a two-season order to their show, uh, Estoil. Estoil? It's got E with an accent and a T, then O-I-L-E. I can't remotely visualize that. Estoyle. 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 I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, starring Mrs. Mazel's duo of Luke Kirby, who won an Emmy for his work in the show, and Gideon Glick, uh, as well as comedy agent standout Camille Cotton, uh, Simon Carlo, Lou Delag, and David Alvarez. So a bunch of cast. I don't recognize any of these names, but the, the, they've cast the show. It's set in New York City in Paris. The eight-episode show follows the dancers and artistic staff 
of two world-renowned ballet companies as they embark on an ambitious gambit to save their storied institutions by swapping their most talented stars. So, ballet plays in Paris, ballet plays in New York, they swap their some of their people. And do some wife swap. <laughs> they do some wife swap. Uh, so that's the premise. Uh, I, obviously, I don't think it's for us, but... I don't either. I'm not surprised Amazon gave this a two-season shot because Miss Maisel has done... Even if not I mean, I don't know how many people actually watch it. I've never heard anyone it's won a say lot of awards. It. It's got a lot of acclaim. It's got stuff. cred to it, and I think it's more of a, hey, you you gave us five seasons of easy awards, basically, or at least it's even if they didn't win all of them, they they got nominated a lot the whole time, and it's it, it helped give them reputation, right? I think that matters to somewhere like Amazon, you know, and you know, all all of these you know, relatively speaking, new you know new places. Yeah, networks and they've been going for decades they need that reputation more than they need a hit uh, no no I, I i get it it makes sense i understand why they're getting the uh the yeah. early order and whatever but uh so yeah uh next up darby kane's best-selling suspense novel pretty little wife is getting a tv adaptation amazon studios is developing the series based on the book with gabriella union set to star and executive produce so, based on Kane's international bestseller, Pretty Little Wife is a cat and mouse thriller with a pulpy edge and some sexy soap that centers on around two. I love how it says that. It almost feels like it's literally talking about soap, not not like it does. a sexy soap. It's like and some sexy soap. It's like so like a soap bar that's got like a bit of a curve to have, it. Have a drawing on it. Uh, is, 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 is it a sculpture made out of the soap? Uh, anyway, it centers on two brilliant and very different black women, Lily. The pretty little wife suspected of murdering her husband and Ginny, the detective on the case. Upon entering each other's lives, they begin to crack open each other's facade, or facade, uh, to reveal what really lies beneath. Okay. Um, it kind of actually sounded a lot more generic than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's pretty generic sounded. I, I don't have much to say on it. But yeah. There you go. That's uh, that. And then the last story of the week. Uh, and we have one network thing. So Fox... Please don't be CBS. Oh, I got, wait, hang on. No, Fox, that's like the second worst. <laughs> Fox has given a straight to series order to... So there's a colon in this. Oh, wait, of course I, there is. I want to say that before I say this. Wait, Rest... does that mean it's already something that exists and this is a spin-off? No, I don't think it is, which is okay. even weirder. Uh, rescue High Surf. That's rescue colon hi dash surf. Oh, rescue hi surf. A Hawaii lifeguard drama from the John Wells production in the Wells broadcast with uh, is slated to premiere in the twenty twenty three to twenty twenty four season. We'll see about that. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, where and it'll be co produced by Warner Brothers Television. Blah blah. blah. Rescue High Surf is an action drama that follows the personal and professional lives of the heavy water <laughs> lifeguards who patrol and protect the North Shore of a Oahu, the most famous and dangerous stretch of the coastline in the world. Uh, each episode will feature these dedicated, heroic, and adrenaline-seeking first responders saving lives in the difficult and often life-threatening conditions of Hawaii's Seven Mile Miracle. <laughs> No, that got a good drink because the only network show of the night, and they managed to hit it, and they hit it word for word. Not even like a variation, just just bang on the classic. And not even just word for word. They had it in the very like usually it's at the end of the description. This was in the very start they, of it. They just ah, oh, they just went in for it. They gave us personal and professional before they even got to like what all the, the show was. <laughs> yeah, the fluffy talk of like yeah. You know, you know what to expect from this? It's I should know. I, yeah. Fox are getting just as bad as CBS, huh? if not worse. They're all. I mean, it's not like, not like NBC and CBS or uh, ABC and NBC are that much better these days either. Like they're not all. They're all much, like. But... They're they're all sort of just merging into the same generic broadcast style shows because everything else has went elsewhere. So. I just think in eight months' time, when this strikes over, <laughs> this is where our hopes lie. <laughs> <laughs> but with this, with rescue high surf. Oh dear. But anyway, that is all the news for uh, this week. And it's really been the last couple of weeks. Uh, so you did get a couple an episode last week or so, but you got almost a two hour one <laughs> this week. Uh, will there be 
news next week i mean honestly that just kind of depends if there's enough news it's not just the writer strike stuff do, do we do a, a weekly video just mm-hmm. update yes the right the strike is still happening no there's no news <laughs> <laughs> the writer strike exists. Uh, it is not ended yet. Uh, stay tuned for further updates. Uh, yeah. Now I, I don't. I don't know. But um, yeah. So just if if the news is a bit wonkier in the next few weeks or possibly longer, it's because it's just writer strike and there's nothing else. But uh, we'll see. Because you know most of that news we talked about on that sh- that episode, most of it was from before this past week. Like the majority of it was the two weeks before the. Writer's they strike. announced the writer strike on the first which was monday mm. to start on you know midnight into the tuesday on the second so nothing has happened this week except yeah everyone's on strike yeah that, that's been everything's been that so hey um yeah there you go that, that, that's the <laughs> that's the news uh so hopefully you enjoyed your time here um People who are looking forward to Babylon 5 reviews returning, uh, the first one back has been recorded. It'll be up on Patreon the next few days, and then it'll be up for everyone else the following week. And that should be back weekly until it's finished, and then we'll be returning to Twilight Zone on the main tower reviews. Uh, me and Car did do a trek this week. It's up for Patreon already, so that'll be up for everyone next week. Uh, and we'll try and make sure they stick to weekly. We'll do our goddamn best. But it's, it's Carter's fault, basically, is the... It's the is the short I'm having answer. a tough time at work right now. Yeah. Because uh, all the mean 19 year olds keep telling you you're going to be 30 next year. I, I mean, okay, that doesn't help, but that's not really the problem. Uh, I'm almost 30. I'm in a midlife crisis. <laughs> midlife. A yeah, good point. The way you eat, you're already probably at two thirds, but. <laughs> Look, just because I eat fast food five days a week. <laughs> At least. Listen to that sentence. Just listen, just hear that sentence back to yourself. No, no, no. I, I heard it. But also, uh, somehow, I have lost a significant amount of weight in the last year. That's because you so walk I, to work a lot, probably. I, I live eight minutes away. Never mind then. I, retra- I, 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 I retract that statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I live really close. It's like... Okay, but you didn't used to. You moved recently, to be fair. Sure, but I've still lost weight since moving. I don't know. Lactose intolerant made it easy to lose weight. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It probably helped because I don't eat any chocolate. There's no, there's no cheese. There's, there's no ice cream. Oh, it's all quite fatty stuff. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It it, it does help. If, anyway, this is this is a bit of TV news, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for 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 joining us. Uh, we'll we'll see you this soon. Hopefully, if there's news to talk about. But uh, let us know what you think of everything that's going on. And the comments, like, subscribe, ding the bell for notifications and all that stuff. You can support all the content over at patreon.com slash TV. And, uh, of course, check out Mailfuzz Movies because there's a lot of movie podcasts. There's three regular shows on there now. Uh, and, and more coming at the end of the month, it seems. Yeah. Well, that's kind of like an extension of one of the, the running shows. Hey, it's but, still more. But, yeah, there's, there's, there's three tentpole shows over there between Ace, which is a sci-fi movie podcast, Streams After Midnight, there's the horror movie podcast, and then Collector's Cut, which is the show where we do different... You know, this month, we're doing the first half of the Fast and the Furious franchise. So, uh, today, when this goes out, it will also be the same day on the movie channel where our review of Fast and the Furious 1 goes out, and you can see me be just a miserable piece of shit. I, I think it's worth noting the first half is the worst half of the franchise. No, it is. It absolutely is. So, I mean, yeah, you, you gotta get... I'm not saying you gotta get through to get to the gold, but... Because that would be... <laughs> You know, putting the back half of it a bit strongly, but it's better. Mm-hmm. You'll have a better time when you do the next half. Uh-huh. Yeah, we just did uh, a month of video game movie adaptations. Uh, you know, oh, next next okay. month we'll be doing the Indiana Jones movies, which, building up to the new ones. So, which, which video games did you do? Because uh, we did Mario ninety three, the new Mario. We did Street Fighter ninety four, and Uncharted. Oh man, you even did Doom. Sorry, you didn't do Doom. No, we didn't do well. I had four slots. Although for the bonus episode on Patreon, we also did Street Fighter: The Legend of Chun Li, starring Kristen Crook, who goes That's through everyone's favorite actress from from a network <laughs> TV show in the early two thousands. She goes through like a Batman Begins style thing in that, where she's like meant to be living homeless and like eating on the streets, and it is the most laughable thing ever. 
there's a Netflix there's a shot thing. where it starts on some homeless people eating like scraps and it the camera pulls back to her eating like something and she's got like a little bit of dirt on her cheek that's like how you know she's homeless <laughs> and she's living rough it's amazing it's it's terrible she's, she's, look she's a phenomenal actress i'm sure she sold it <laughs> <laughs> damien dark's in there chris klein <laughs> if we're going with cw actors oh, Chris Klein, you remember him? Every meta must die. That's him. How could I forget? He, he's in there. Damien Dark's in there. It's a whole, it's a whole, uh, uh, shebang. But that, that's only on Patreon. If you want to get access to that, you have to go to patreon.com slash TV and, uh, get access to the bonus content. But, uh, so check it out. So that's the show, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. We always appreciate it. Keep watching TV. Have you got any vanilla?